Wormwood! I have been thinking very hard about the questions in your recent tweets. If, as I have clearly shown, all selves are by their very nature in competition, and thus the enemy's idea of love is a contradiction in terms, what then becomes of my reiterated warning that he really loves the human vermin, and that he really desires their freedom and continued existence? I hope, my dear boy, that you have not shown my videos to any demons. Not that it really matters, of course. Anyone would clearly see that the appearance of heresy into which I have fallen was purely accidental. By the way, I hope you and all other viewers also understood that uh, some apparently uncomplimentary references to Slubgob were only jokes. I really hold him in the highest regard. And also some comments I made about not shielding you from the authorities. Really, my dear boy, I have only your interests at heart. The truth is that I slipped by mere carelessness into saying that the enemy really loves the humans. That, of course, is an impossibility. He is one being, and they are distinct from him. Their good cannot be his. All his talk about love must be a disguise for something else. He must have some real motive for creating them and taking so much care about them. The reason one comes to talk as if he really had this impossible love is our utter failure to find out that real motive. What does he stand to make from them? That is the unsolvable question. I do not see that it can do any harm to tell you that this very problem was one of the chief causes of our father's original quarrel with the enemy. When the creation of humanity was first discussed, and when, even at that stage, the enemy freely confessed that he foresaw a certain episode about a cross, our father naturally sought an audience and asked for an explanation. The enemy gave no reply except to produce the raving lunacy about disinterested love that he has been circulating ever since. This, obviously, our father could not accept. He implored the enemy to lay his cards on the table and gave him every opportunity. He admitted to a real anxiety to know the secret, and the enemy replied, I wish with all my heart that you did. It was, I imagine, at this stage of the interview that our father's disgust with the unprovoked lack of confidence caused him to remove himself an infinite distance from the presence, with such suddenness that it has given rise to the ridiculous enemy story that he was forcibly thrown out of heaven. Since then, we've begun to see why our oppressor was so secretive. His throne depends on the secret. Members of his faction have frequently admitted that if we should ever come to understand what he really means by love, the war would be over and we should be allowed to re-enter heaven. That is the great task. We know that he cannot really love. Nobody can. It doesn't make sense. If only we could find out what he is really up to. Hypothesis after hypothesis has been tried, and still we cannot find out. Yet, we must never lose hope. More and more collections of data, more and more complicated theories, richer rewards for researchers who make progress, deeper punishments for those who fail. All of this, accelerated forever until the end of time, cannot possibly fail to succeed. You complain that my last video does not make it clear whether I consider being in love a desirable state for a human or not. But really, Wormwood, that is the sort of question one expects them to ask. Leave them to discuss whether or not love, or patriotism, or altars, or candles, or teetotalism, or education is good or bad. Can't you see? There is no answer! Nothing at all matters except for the tendency of a given state of mind, under given circumstances, with a particular patient at a particular moment in time, to move them nearer the enemy or nearer to us. Thus it would be good for you to get the patient to decide whether love is good or bad. If he is an arrogant man, with a contempt for the body really based on delicacy, but mistaken by him for purity, and if he takes pleasure in scorning what his fellows approve, then by all means let him decide against love. Instill into him a conceited asceticism, and once you have separated his sexuality from all that might humanize it, bring it back to him in a much more cynical form. If, on the other hand, he is an emotional, gullible man, then feed him on minor poets and fifth-rate novelists of the old school, until he believes that love is both irresistible and somehow intrinsically meritorious. This belief, I'll grant you, is not that useful in producing casual unchastity, but it is a wonderful recipe for producing great, long, noble, romantic adulteries, which, if all goes well, end in murders and suicides. Failing that, it can be used to steer your patient into a useful marriage. For marriage, though the enemy's invention, has some uses. There must be several young women in your patient's neighborhood who would render the Christian life intensely difficult to him, if only you could persuade him to marry one of them. Please send me a report on this. In the meantime, get it clear in your own mind that this state of falling in love is not necessarily favorable to us or to the other side. It is simply an occasion which both we and the enemy are trying to exploit. Like most things that the humans get excited about, age and youth, war and peace, it is, from the point of view of the spiritual life, mainly raw material.